In our previous video, we looked at simplicity and how the simplest worldview is not always the most plausible. In fact, simplicity cannot increase plausibility by itself, it must be filtered through the lens of explanationism. In this video, I want to go over the logic of science. A central concept in philosophy of science is that of evidence confirming or supporting a hypothesis. As these terms are used by philosophers of science, a hypothesis H can be confirmed by evidence E, but still be, in fact, false. To say that E confirms or supports H is just to say that E gives us some reason to believe H. The HD model is one attempt to explicate this concept. 1. H is confirmed by E if and only if H entails E2. H is disconfirmed by E if and only if H entails not E. There are several problems for this crude version of hypothetical deductivism. Problem 1. Degrees of confirmation. The crude HD model doesn't tell us how much a hypothesis is confirmed. Clearly, not all confirmed hypotheses are confirmed equally. Suppose I observe two ravens and note that they're both black. This seems like some evidence that all ravens are black, but it's not very strong evidence. By contrast, Kepler's careful observations of the locations of the heavenly bodies and their close fit with the predictions of his theory that the planets moved in ellipses around the sun in accordance with his three laws of planetary motion provide much stronger evidence for that theory. So it seems that we can have different degrees of confirmation. It would be nice if a theory of confirmation could tell us when we had more confirmation and when we had less. Problem two, underdetermination. Often we have several theories, all of which entail the observed data. For example, the Ptolemaic and Copernican theories made the same predictions about the locations of the heavenly bodies. According to the HD model, astronomical observations entailed by these theories confirmed both of them. This may be true, but it would again be nice if we had some way of choosing between such empirically equivalent theories, or at least telling which one is more probable. One way we can choose between empirically equivalent theories is by running more tests. Maybe those will turn up results inconsistent with one of the theories. If, for example, Ptolemy's theory predicts that there is no change in the heavenly sphere beyond the realm of the moon, this is disconfirmed by Kepler's observation of a new star, a supernova in fact, in the heavens. One problem with this solution is that sometimes we'll have theories that make all the same predictions or that are such that we don't presently have the technology to test differing predictions of theirs. Problem three, the need for auxiliary assumptions. One, suggest that we can logically derive predictions directly from theories. But in most actual cases, predictions derived from a scientific theory invoke auxiliary assumptions independent of the theory. For example, the Copernican theory implies that there ought to be a change in the relative position of the fixed stars to the Earth, a stellar parallax. But to derive observable consequences from this, we need at least two assumptions. The first is that whatever technological apparatus we use for astronomical observation, like a telescope, is functioning properly. The second is that we are close enough to the stars to observe this relative change through the telescopes or other instruments we have. Neither of these are entailed by the Copernican theory. In fact, a parallax was not observed until the 19th century. The reason is that the second assumption was false prior to the 19th century, when telescopes were not yet powerful enough to detect the parallax, too, faces a similar problem. Often we need auxiliary assumptions to derive predictions from a theory that we then observe to be false, for example. Defenders of the Ptolemaic theory sometimes denied the first of our above assumptions. In particular, they denied that telescopes work properly when pointed at the heavens. But, intuitively, the observation of an apparent new star through the telescope still disconfirms the Ptolemaic theory even if we have to admit that we can't be sure that the flaw lies with the theory rather than with our instrument. Similarly, the Copernican theory was initially disconfirmed by the lack of a stellar parallax, even though, as Copernicus and Galileo thought, the reason a parallax was not observed was not because heliocentrism was false, but because the fixed stars were too far away. Letting us stand for our auxiliary assumptions, we can alter the HD model to account for this. One. H is confirmed by E if and only if H and A entail E2. H is disconfirmed by E if and only if H and A entail not E. But this brings in new problems. First, it's not clear what we should include in our auxiliary assumptions. Second, one is now too strong. For H and A entails A. But learning that A is true shouldn't confirm H if H doesn't give us any reason to expect A. For example, learning that our telescope is functioning properly shouldn't by itself confirm the Copernican theory. 
Similarly, 2 is too strong because H and A entails A, but learning that not A should not necessarily disconfirm H. For example, learning that our telescope is not functioning properly shouldn't by itself disconfirm the Copernican theory. Perhaps we can solve this second problem by disallowing cases where A entails not E by itself. 1. H is confirmed by E if and only if H and A entails E and A not entail E. 2. H is disconfirmed by E if and only if H and A entails not E and A not entail not E. Problem 4. Confirmation by non-entailed evidence 1 is still too weak. Theories can be confirmed by facts that they don't entail, even when conjoined with auxiliary assumptions. One example is statistical theories. Suppose I formulate a theory that says that democracies are less likely to go to war with each other than non-democracies, not that democracies never go to war, just that they're less likely to. That does not entail of any two democracies that they will not go to war with each other, but it seems that if I observe a lot of historical evidence and find only two cases of democracies going to war with each other and 200 cases of non-democracies going to war with each other, then I've gotten pretty good evidence for my theory. Another example is disconfirming a rival theory. If Kepler's observation of a new star disconfirmed Ptolemy's theory, then it seems that it ought to confirm his own rival theory of the movements of the heavenly bodies. A final extreme example is when our evidence entails a theory. If we gather some evidence such that E entails H, then it certainly seems like E confirms H, but this is not consistent with one. For one says that E confirms H only if H and A entails E, but E can entail H without the converse being true. For example, the proposition that the heavens change is entailed by the fact that a particular star is going supernova, but the converse is not true even if we add in reasonable auxiliary assumptions. One might object that scientific theories are never entailed by the evidence. But the proposition that the heavens change sounds like a scientific theory. It was, for example, disputed by scientists. If the HD theorist wishes to maintain that it is not, he owes us an account of what it takes for a proposition to count as a scientific theory. Formulating this account would be a difficult task for the HD theorist. Now what about falsificationism? Popper's falsificationism said that no scientific hypothesis H can ever be confirmed by E, in the sense that E could give us reason to believe that H is true or probably true. Rather, all we can do is refute hypotheses by showing them to be false. Popper then proposed falsifiability as a test, not for the truth of a theory, but of its scientific status. The more falsifiable a theory is, the more scientific it is. If we try to falsify a falsifiable theory and fail, then Popper says that the theory has been corroborated. But this does not mean the theory is probably true. It just means that it has not yet been shown to be false. Falsificationism, however, faces the Duhem problem. On Duhem's underdetermination problem, it is impossible to test a scientific theory in isolation because it is always possible that a negative experimental result is the fault not of the theory of interest but of some other auxiliary hypothesis. This was a serious problem for Popper's criterion of falsifiability, for it appears to imply that no scientific theory is falsifiable in the sense that we can conclusively prove it false by experiment. Bayesian accounts of scientific confirmation arguably retain the best of both these theories while avoiding their problems. The Bayesian model of scientific confirmation that I will present here says that if E stands for some evidence that scientists have in their possession, K is their background knowledge apart from E, and H is some hypothesis of interest. E confirms H relative to K if the probability, H conditional on E and K, is greater than the probability H conditional on K. That is to say, E confirms H for us, if it raises its probability relative to our background knowledge. Bayesians tend to use confirms and is evidence for interchangeably, so that we can also say E is evidence for H relative to K if the probability of H conditional on E and K is greater than the probability H conditional on K. One important implication of the above analyses is that confirmation is always relative to background knowledge. E might be evidence for H relative to K, but not relative to K. For example, in the 18th and early 19th centuries, astronomers observed that the orbit of Uranus differed from the orbit predicted by Newtonian mechanics, given that Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus are the only planets in the solar system. Since there was at that time no independent evidence for the existence of an eighth planet, 
It is plausible that these observations lowered the probability of Newtonian mechanics and were thus evidence against it. Nevertheless, in the mid 19th century, astronomers discovered Neptune in precisely the location needed to explain Uranus's orbit on Newtonian mechanics. Relative to this new knowledge, the probability that Uranus had its observed orbit given Newtonian mechanics was near one, and so relative to this new knowledge, the above observations provide strong evidence for Newton's theory. More formally, let N be Newtonian mechanics, O the observed orbit of Uranus, K the initial knowledge of scientists, and D the discovery of Neptune. Plausibly, the probability N conditional on O and K is less than the probability N conditional on K and probability of n conditional on O and D and K is greater than the probability of n conditional on D and K. It follows that O is evidence against n relative to K, but evidence for n relative to D and K. On this notion, we can take the sequential view of background knowledge, which is where we gather evidence sequentially, and so our background knowledge is really just background evidence or evidence that we gathered before we look at some later sequential data. I mentioned this in the previous video, and this is the view of background knowledge I shall be assuming when it comes to our k variable. So modeling scientific reasoning with probability theory and Bayesian confirmation theory lets us measure the degree to which a failed prediction disconfirms both a theory and auxiliary assumptions on the basis of which that the prediction was derived. In fact, within the philosophy of science, philosophers talk about auxiliary hypotheses a1, A2, etc. as relevant to the predictions that a hypothesis H makes so that the probability of evidence E might be different given H and A1, H and A2, etc. Thus, within the context of explanationism, the probability of E conditional on H and A1 or the probability of E conditional on H and A2 are basic probabilities. So in that sense, auxiliary hypotheses change the probability of some evidence given our hypothesis. There's no general rule for how they change it. It depends on the main hypothesis and the auxiliary hypotheses and if they are similar to each other. So this means that scientific hypotheses don't predict anything at all independent from auxiliary hypotheses. So every prediction needs to be filtered by combining the main and auxiliary hypothesis. Thus, confirmation and disconfirmation is only possible through conjoining main hypotheses with auxiliary hypotheses. And this applies to literally all abductive or Bayesian reasoning, and it is an important foundational axiom of science. Given this fact, when it comes to theism, we need to apply the same rules. I propose a formal framework. Let's have theism be the proposition that there is a fundamental omnipotence power who governs creation and change on the basis of normative goodness. Now this entails that God will always act towards valuable states of affairs. But doing this requires auxiliary hypotheses about value. Thus, if we want theism to make predictions, we must conjoin it with an auxiliary hypothesis about what is valuable. So every theistic prediction needs to be filtered through some auxiliary axiological theory. There is no logical way out of this, both for theist and atheist, since any time we make a value judgment that we would expect God to do X, we automatically now use our value theory to make those judgments and predictions. Therefore, theistic confirmation and disconfirmation is only possible through conjoining theism with an axiological auxiliary hypothesis. And this applies to literally all abductive and Bayesian arguments for and against theism that use any notion of epistemic probability. So under theism, states of affairs are at the most general level expected to the extent that they are good states of affairs, that they realize some kind of value, and the higher the value, the higher the expectation. Of course, there will be a large, infinitely number of ways of realizing the highest goods. There are likely to be very high goods, the quote exemplification of which in a world is not compossible. So no particular way of realizing them will have an antecedently high mathematical probability. But we are not trying to predict in advance which goods will be realized in which ways. We are retrodicting, asking ourselves what makes sense of what we take to be the case. When doing this, what matters is not so much which tokens occur, but rather which types are tokened. Given that God is a rational agent, we expect the best kinds of values to be tokened. And of course, for means to serve ends well, we want the goods we brought out in the most fitting way. In science, we often retrodict from the data rather than a priori predict. We ask what is most likely to be the case given our theory and given the total evidence we have available to us. But this requires the formal framework and this is how theism and the logic of science work together. We can join theism with an axiology to generate antecedent likelihood judgments and then 
we go into the world and confirm those with the evidence. Now, sometimes we may predict the wrong things. In this case, we can update our antecedent judgments to match the data we see in the world. There is no a priori way to do this since it depends on a posteriori data. To use an example, let's say that I form a hypothesis about quantum gravity, and let's say that I can join it with the fact that my theory entails that there will be strings. And let's say that the goal of my theory of quantum gravity is really to combine quantum mechanics with general relativity. The auxiliary assumption about strings is just one way quantum gravity could be true, but of course there may be others. However, let's say that we discover something called the Z-force, and that includes no strings. What do we conclude? Well, we would conclude that quantum gravity is true even if our initial expectations were wrong. In this case, we were wrong about strings being involved in the explanation. But it would be absurd for me to conclude that quantum gravity cannot work as a theory because my initial expectations were mistaken. Similarly, if our initial expectations about what theism predicts are wrong, that can either be due to the fault of the theory or the fault of the axiological auxiliary hypothesis. Figuring this out requires meta-principles in which we can distinguish between when the main theory fails and when the auxiliary theory fails. That will be the topic for the next video, but when it comes to any theistic predictions based on the logic of science, this is the framework we will be assuming for the rest of the series.